I think it'll be a worthwhile talk for you to come see. Uh, this gentleman, he has a PhD uh, from Tulane. I think his PhD is from Tulane in neuroscience. And so if you're interested in going into neuroscience research, then he'll be interesting to hear about. But also he has recently been accepted to Tulane Med School. Like, you know, he applied to med school, he didn't get in, and so he went to graduate school instead, and now he's going to medical school. So he'll talk about sort of his process of go of applying and being accepted in medical school. Uh, the talk is from is it 415? One week from tomorrow. And then there's also going to be a reception. Many of you have been to those receptions. There'll be food and stuff, so you know, cookies and fruit. So feel free to come to the reception in the conference room and then the talk afterwards at 415. I think it should be a really good talk. And he'll talk about medical school as well. So if you're pre-med, it's worth taking an hour out of your day if you can spare it. All right, we are going to have our test on Monday. We'll probably wrap up this probably wrap up the material today, but then we'll have a number of clicker questions for us to do that we'll probably won't finish until Wednesday. And then Friday, as usual, we'll have a review day uh, on Friday in class, and we'll have our exam on Monday. So let's see, last time we left off, it's like we were on Doppler effect. Uh, is that right? Yeah, getting into interference and resonance. We've already seen a lot of this when we did the light on uh, uh, the chapter on interference with light. That's why I like putting these two chapters together because they have a lot of the same stuff. Light and sound are both waves, and so they act very much in the same way. So let's look at interference and resonance. And hopefully some of it will be familiar to you if you didn't core dump it all over the break. Were there any big events over the break, by the way? You got a puppy? Really? It's spring break, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you went to that. How was it? Yeah? Cool. A what? A moon thing? Unless, yeah, there's a solar eclipse on the very first day of class, coming back in the fall. Uh, we're actually going to stay here. My wife is going to do a special event. She has class, I think, during 3 M. And so she's going to give a talk about the eclipse, is my understanding. There'll, there'll be a public announcement. But then afterwards, out in the quad, there's going to be viewing of the solar eclipse. It's not a full eclipse here. It's only 75%. But 75% doesn't happen that often. I mean, a complete solar eclipse, that's like once in a lifetime event. But you have to go to Missouri or West Virginia to see it. But woo, woo, West Virginia. Uh, and so... Anyway, we're not going to go, but we're going to have a thing here for y'all. If you want to come out and see Western Special Glasses, you can look at it. But first day of class, be on the lookout for it in August. Okay, so always interfere with one another. We saw that with light waves. And uh, sound waves will interfere in the same way as light. And waves can have either constructive or destructive interference, just like we saw before. That's great. Too. All right, so you remember with constructive, if I have a wave that adds up like this, where the peaks line up, when I add those together, I get one that has the same frequency but twice the amplitude. And then if I have waves that wait, that add up where the peaks and troughs are, are lined up like that, I get a wave with no amplitude. All right? So we see that in mechanical waves, light waves, and in sound waves. Constructive and destructive interference. Uh, if any of y'all have noise-canceling headphones, this is kind of cool, actually. You mind noise-canceling headphones? Yeah, a few of you? My uh, noise canceling headphones work by this principle. They detect the ambient noise and they produce a um, an out of phase sound wave to cancel the outside sounds. An out of phase, completely out of phase, 
to cancel out any outside sounds. So let's say that the, the ambient noise, I don't know, looks something like this. It has a really funky thing, but let's say that the ambient noise, say in this room, uh, looks like this. You're, you put your noise canceling headphones on, and they have a microphone on the outer part of it that detects this waveform. They detect this sound, and it analyzes what that sound looks like, and it produces a sound that looks exactly the opposite. Uh, sorry, let's see, that should go up. Exactly the opposite of the other. And then when you add these two up, you have no noise at all. So in real time, it will detect the noise that you have outside of your little, you know, headphone world, and it will produce another sound that's exactly opposite, completely out of phase with it, like this one, that's inverted, basically, and it gives you that sound in your headphones. And then, so the, the ambient noise that's coming into your headphones from outside, from around those cushions, uh, it combines with this sound, and it gets rid of it completely. That's pretty cool, no? Yeah, so those are your noise-canceling headphones. So, what type of interference takes place in noise-canceling headphones? Is it constructive, destructive, or is it explosive interference? All right, we'll stop at 25, 25, let's go for 100% on this, 25, 25, 25, okay, very good, uh, B is right answer, hey, what do you call <coughs> twin boys, a sunset, <laughs> Do a special request now. So if y'all have any jokes, you can send them to me, okay? They can't be vulgar. They need to be short. I can't tell a whole big story. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're going to look at uh, resonance and normal modes. When we have... Oh, wait. I'm sorry. I want to do one other thing before we do that. Let's talk about beats first. We're going to sort of wedge it in right here. Beats occur... When you have um, waves of two different frequencies. Uh, what you get when you combine a wave of two different frequencies. Let's say that I have a wave like this. And then I have a wave like this, with two very different frequencies. What you get in this is that you get a wave that's a combination of the two. So it's sort of hard, but it's going to look sort of something like this. It's a combination of those two waves together. And what you'll get when you combine these two waves is a frequency. You ever tune a stringed instrument? You ever tune a stringed instrument like a piano or a guitar or uh, I don't know, a harp or whatever? When you tune a stringed instrument, what you do is you strike a note, and then you create another note, either with a tuner or with another instrument, or maybe even with the same instrument that you're doing. So like in a guitar, if you have one string that's in tune, you strike that note, and then you'll strike the same note on a second string. And what you want to do is you get those two notes so they sound exactly the same. But if they have even just a little bit of a frequency difference, you'll get a phenomenon called beats where you'll get this sort of wah, wah, wah sound. And that wah, wah, wah sound has a frequency that's equal to the difference in the two frequencies. So the beat frequency is equal to the absolute value of your two different frequencies. Let me show you. Has anybody looked at a tone generator since we used one last time? They're pretty cool. There's a bunch online, so let's... Uh, Here's one, online tone generator. I'm going to create a nice frequency, say around 100 hertz or so. Is that too annoying? All right, now I'm going to open up another one. Have I shown you this yet? 
I showed you the beats already. Have I showed you the beats? All right. All right. What was it at? One eleven, I think. All right. So now I have two tones that are exactly the same. And when you're tuning an instrument, that's what you want. You want them to be exactly the same. But notice what happens when I just go a little bit off. So now I have one tone at 110 hertz and another tone at 109 hertz. Can you tell the difference in the two? Like when you combine them, I go from this very constant tone to a tone like that. Now what is the frequency of this tone? How many times per second is the tone going in and out? One, two, three, four, five. It has a frequency of one hertz. That means it has one beat per second, or one wavelength per second. So if I have a beat of one hertz, then that means it's going, you know, or if I have a, a difference in frequency, I have 110 and 109, that means that my beat frequency is one hertz, one time per second. Notice what happens when I make this bigger. So now I have a beat frequency. I have 116 here, 109 there. What's my beat frequency? Seven times per second, because that, that's the difference in the two frequencies. One of those seven, one of those seven, one of those seven. All right, there's seven times per second. And then if I go higher, it'll get more and more. It'll get faster and faster. So that's a nice way to find the or to tune an instrument because it's very easy to tell when they're exactly the same frequency. You can tell just one hertz very, very easily because you'll hear that distinctive wah wah sound. So those are beats. They occur because of this combination or the interference of two different waves. It's a lot kind of like your noise canceling headphones as well. Now let's look at resonances and normal modes. Let me write that out here just to make sure we get that. This is called normal modes. A resonance can occur. in a tube closed on one end. We'll actually look at uh, a tube that's closed on one end and then also a tube that is closed on both ends. And then you can do a similar thing with tubes that are open on both ends as well. But we'll just look at a tube that's closed on one end. I don't know, like a, like a flute, for example. A flute is closed on one end and open on the other. But you can get resonance in these tubes when the tube has some multiple or has a uh, the tube length is some multiple of quarter wavelengths. And to remember this, the best thing you want to do is just remember what happens at the closed end of the tube and what happens at the open end of the tube. Now at the closed end of the tube, the wave is locked into a node. And a node is just when the amplitude is zero. So this is my closed tube. At this end, my wave is going to be a node. It's going to come up and it'll go like this. So this, in a wave, is called a node. And on the other end, at the open end, or excuse me, the air movement here is halted. So at a node, there is no air movement. No air movement at all. all right, remember with our pressure waves, they, uh, well, they actually move side to side, but we can think of the wave actually moving up and down. And at this point, that wave is locked into place. It doesn't move up and down. Or if it helps you to think of it better, the wave is actually moving side to side. And so it's like at this point, it just bumps into that side and it can't move at that point. That's called a node. At the open end, the reflected wave is at an anti-node. And this end is called an anti-node. It's always going to look like this. No matter how, well, if you have this resonance, it'll always look like it. Uh, at an anti-node, you have maximum amplitude. And you can undergo total constructive interference. That means I have 
this way that maximum amplitude, it adds up with other waves as they travel through the uh, tube. Now I'm going to have four scenarios here, just sort of illustrate these to you. So let's do the first resonant frequency. Or this is the, uh, the fundamental frequency, actually. With the fundamental frequency, you get a wave that looks like this. I have a node on this end, and it goes up to that point. Now remember, with my wave, if I had this longer tube, don't draw this, but I'm going to draw it here just to give you some reference. If I had a longer tube, then I would get a wave that would extend out like that. But I'm just getting a small section of it. Don't draw this, because I'm going to use this space. Just draw it here. But this is just one small part of a wave. If it were to extend out, it would go on. I'll draw a wave that does extend out in just a second. So, my fundamental overtone, I get a wave that looks like this. Now, often we'll actually draw two waves. I'll draw one that has a positive amplitude. Whoops. And then also one that has a negative amplitude. Like this. So that's my fundamental overtone. Uh, This is also sometimes called the first harmonic. And these are two identical things. The fundamental overtone or the first harmonic. Now, what is the length of this pipe in terms of wavelength? What fraction of a wavelength have I gone through in this point? You'd think a half. Let's think. So if I look at my wave, I'm actually going, this is a full wavelength, right? My wavelength goes from here to here. I am, in this particular overtone, I've gone from here to here. And so that's what amount, what fraction of wavelength? That's a quarter wavelength, right? So be careful with this, that uh, it's always going to be a quarter wavelength. The tube has some multiple of quarter wavelengths. And in this case, my tube has a length equal to one quarter wavelength. All right. So I could say then that lambda is equal to four times the length of the tube. The wavelength of this first overtone, this fundamental overtone, this first harmonic, has a wavelength that's four times the length of the tube. Now we're blowing to a Coke bottle. Ooh, you know what I'm talking about? The frequency of that is set by the shape of the bottle some, but mainly by the length of the bottle, because it's a tube that's closed on one end and open on the other end. Now let's look at the first overtone, which is also called the second harmonic. Uh, I'm going to draw it for space. I'm going to draw it the same length. But this is the first overtone. It's sometimes called the second harmonic. And it's just like the other, except, you know, you still got to have the node at one end and the an anti-node at the other end, except now, it's going to look like, uh, shoot, I didn't do that right. It's going to look like this. All right, so this is my second harmonic. I just go through, not through a quarter wavelength, but now my tube goes through how many quarters of wavelengths? One, two, three, four, five. How many quarters of wavelengths have I gone through? Well, this is a quarter right here, right? So that's the same as what I had over here. And so this is another quarter, and so this is a third quarter. So the length of this tube is three quarters of a wavelength. In my second harmonic, length is equal to three-quarter wavelengths. And so my wavelength then is equal to uh, four-thirds L. I can draw my third harmonic or my second overtone. You probably get the, the gist of it now. But this is my third harmonic. And it's going to look like this. I'll go up down, and then back up again. And then drawing the other wave. 
It looks like that. Now, in this case, the wavelength is four fifths. Or the length is five fourths of a wavelength. So the wavelength is four fifths of your length L. That's for your third harmonic. And then we can go ahead and do the third overtone or the fourth harmonic just for fun. Because as you, if you ever blown into a bottle, you can get higher tones depending on how quickly you blow air across the bottle. And that's these different overtones. This is our third overtone. I'm still going to have a node at one end and an anti-node at the other end. Let's see, I'm going to go up, down, up, down, up, down, up down like that I can draw the other wave that's my third overtone um, my third overtone is also called the fourth harmonic and with this one let's see uh, L is equal to seven fourths of a wavelength so the wavelength is equal to four sevenths of uh, L. Alrighty? So those are our, our different harmonics, or overtones. Um, we can come up with a generic form for the frequency here. Our frequency is given then as um, Well, actually, let me let me step back here. Let's give the frequency for each one of these. Now, remember frequency. V is equal to lambda f. So frequency then. Frequency is v over lambda. And so for each of these, I can develop an expression for 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 uh, the frequency. Here, the frequency is going to be v over 4l. Here is going to the frequency is going to be uh, 3v over 4l. Here the frequency is going to be 5v over 4l. And here the frequency is going to be uh, 7v over 4l. That's the frequency of the different harmonics. And notice that each of them is dependent upon the speed of the wave. That doesn't change. That's dependent upon your medium. And then also the length of the tube. And so I can get these different frequencies that change with the length of the tube. And so here, my um, I can develop a, an expression for the frequency is that it's equal to n times the speed of the wave divided by 4L where n is equal to uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, and increasing on and on. All, right. All the way up, fourth overtone, fifth overtone, sixth overtone. It increases as odd numbers as I step through the different overtones. All right? That's for an open-closed system. You have this, you have this expression on your uh, on your equation sheet that gives you the frequency. But I do want you to be able to tell me, like, is this the fundamental or the first harmonic? Is this the second harmonic? And on and on. You just need to count the number of quarter wavelengths that we have in there to find that. All right. Let me. You don't have space here, but I also want to show you the tones for a closed closed tube. There is a page on page 215, I think. At the very end of your chapter, you have a blank page. So you might want to make yourself a little note, see page 215, because I do want you to see this as well. All right, so for a closed closed tube, that was an open closed. This is a closed closed. It's going to look like this, and you'll have nodes at each end. You'll have a node here, and you'll have a node here. So as you might expect, the fundamental overtone, or the first harmonic, is going to look like this. I'll have a node here, it'll go up, and it'll go down. I'll have a node here, it'll go down, and it'll go back up again. So that is the uh, first harmonic. All right. 
We'll see some questions probably next time that deal with this when we're looking at a string and like a guitar string and we want to know the frequency or the, the speed of the wave and we'll assume that we're dealing with our first harmonic. But we'll see that soon, probably next time. All right, so this is a closed closed tube with our second harmonic. It's going to look like this. It goes up, down, and then up again. Notice here I have a full wavelength. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Fix this. It looks like that. That is my second harmonic. And so with these, I can figure out what is the length of the tube. Here, the length is equal to um, lambda over 2. So the wavelength is equal to 2L. Uh, so the frequency which is, let's say your frequency is V over okay. lambda, so it's going to be V over 2L. All right Now for the second harmonic, my length of the tube is equal to two half wavelengths, or it's one full wavelength, so my frequency then is going to be V over L. All right, so now I can develop this expression for the frequency, and it's going to be n times v divided by 2 times l, uh, where n is just going to be uh, 1, 2, 3, and on and on. So this is for a closed, closed tube, the frequency of a closed, closed tube comes up when you're preparing for the MCAT, and that's why I sort of want to show it, because they often have these resonance frequencies of different tubes, so I wanted you to have some experience with that. Let me show you on the equation sheet, I need to check too, what that looks like on your equation sheet. So I'm pretty sure I have them on there, if not I'll put them on. Um, yeah, there they are. So this is for an open closed tube, and this is for a closed closed tube. By the way, the closed closed tube works out exactly the same as an open open tube. So when we look at our closed closed tube, this is going to be the same for an open open tube. And an open open tube just looks like this. Uh, you get waves that have antinodes at each end. All right, we'll see some concept tests, some clicker questions that deal with this, but I'd also know what an anode and an antinode is, be able to identify the different resonance frequencies, and if I give you values, be able to calculate that, just be able to use the formulae as they are on the, on the equation. All right, uh, just a couple more things, I think. Oh, we're going to look at the ear now. Yeah, so let's look at the ear and sort of sound and as it relates to people. There is a frequency spectrum, as you might know, of sounds that people can hear. Are you all aware of this? There's a range of frequencies. It's a pretty big range. And in fact, the oracle of your ear, that's this fluffy part on the outside of the ear, it is such that it will pick up those particular frequencies that your ear can hear. Uh, the frequencies range from... The audible region of the spectrum range from 20 to 20,000 hertz. I see. We'll try it with our frequency generator. Not everybody can hear 20,000 or 20 hertz. Okay. Yeah. This goes up to 20,100. This might be a little annoying to some of you. Let's try it. I'm gonna turn up the volume a little bit. Y'all hear that? Right, I'm going to go down to about 15,000. Most of us should be able to hear that. Might be loud. Oh, can y'all hear that? Okay, I can't hear a thing. But like as you get older, I was in a like I was in a in a rock band. Y'all know this? Y'all know I was in a band? Yeah, many many years ago. Uh, well, not many. Not many, like 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, but no like 25 years ago. I was in a rock band. And I played bass guitar, and you know, we put really loud and 
it's not very good for your hearing. And when you lose your hearing or when you lose sensitivity to certain frequencies, it doesn't come back, right? Like your ears, they can't repair themselves. So anyway, 13,000 hertz. Let's go a little higher. Is it 15? You hear that? Okay. Is it really annoying? You want to see what your range is? Okay. Let's go to 16. Okay. So 17,000. Okay. I'm going to bring it back, okay? We should, you always know, do. I guess you just turn this on before the next class and just leave it. You <laughs> see what they do. All right, we'll go up to 18,000. Here's 18,000. Yeah. All right, here's 19,000. And then this is 20, this is over 20,000. Most of you probably dropped out. You hear that, anybody? Anybody? No. You might be able to sense it, but not hear it. All right, let's go to the low end of the spectrum. Uh, that's not the real frequency. It's hard to get the low end because we got little bitty speakers in here. Like, you really need some big old woofers. So, yeah, this isn't even going to work. Yeah, that's not the true frequency. Anyway, we'll just stop there. But um, if you have really cool woofers, goodness, I mean, bless you. All right. So the the lowest frequency you can hear, the highest goes from 20 to 20,000 hertz. We experience infrasonic and ultrasonic actually, and uh, those of you going in the medical field will, you know, deal with ultrasonic certainly. But uh, infrasonic. is below the 20 hertz. It's just, you know, below the lowest frequency you can hear. And ultrasonic is above 20,000 hertz. But it can be many millions of hertz, like an ultrasound equipment. Dogs and cats hear ultrasonic, like the dog whistle, for example. Ultrasound equipment uses a frequency of about 20 million hertz. And animals are known to communicate by infrasonic waves. Infrasonic waves can travel over very large distances, like whales, for example. Y'all ever hear the whales? Or yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I got a National Geographic. It had a record inside the magazine that you could play, and it had the whale calls. And like, as a five, six, seven-year-old kid, I was just amazed by the whale calls. They were very mournful. Weren't they mournful? They sound sort of longing and pining away for one another. Probably because they live so darn far away from one another. Like they should just get together and be happy. What's that? Well, just once a year. Like, I can't imagine being away from my life for a year. All right, so uh, these can travel large distances. All right, let's look at anatomy and physiology of speech production. Uh, speech is caused by the movement of air past the vocal cords, or sometimes called the vocal folds. Have y'all had anatomy? Have y'all heard this before? Okay. Well, if you've had anatomy, that's great, but it's fairly interesting. Uh, this air is forced past the vocal cords because of the diaphragm. which can change the volume of the, uh, of the chest cavity. All right, so you all know that the lungs aren't muscles, right? You take the lungs out, they don't do anything. They can't move. But in order to breathe in and out, the lungs get bigger and they get smaller. But they do that because of the diaphragm, this sort of sheet-like muscle that's underneath the lung. The, the diaphragm can make the chest cavity smaller which makes the lungs smaller, which forces air out. It's Boyle's law, right? PV is constant. I remember PV? Part of the ideal gas, all PV is in R2. So if I make my volume small, my pressure is big, and then that forces the air out. Uh, and that's what the diaphragm does. It just changes the volume of the chest cavity, which causes the pressure inside the chest cavity to either get smaller or bigger. 
uh, air moves from the lungs through the trachea, that's the windpipe, and then to the larynx. This is the larynx right here, that sort of thing that holds your vocal cords, your Adam's apple, it sort of holds your vocal cords inside there. Uh, and the larynx holds the um, the vocal cords or the vocal folds. And this is called the Adam's apple. All right, so you got your lungs right here. You got the diaphragm. That sort of muscle underneath. You got the trachea, which comes up. And then uh, you have the larynx, the sort of box right here. Not to scale. This is a person, uh, very long chest, I guess. That's your larynx. And then inside of there, you have the vocal cords. The vocal cords are like two little pieces of. Uh, what muscle, I guess, that come down inside your larynx. Are you serious? Like when it was cut open? Yeah. Huh? Good. Alright, so the cords are actually muscles. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The cords are, that will come later, the cords are inside the larynx. which protects and moves them with cartilage and muscles. So you might have some just sort of basic information about this. What, what is the purpose of these things? What do they do? Uh, how do they work? The cords are actually muscles that can open or close, depending on the situation. And the space between the cords is called the glottis. Are there any singers in the group? I heard a glottal stop. A glottal stop is when you have like a, you stop your sound. And when you do that, you close the glottis. Uh, we do this with like hard consonant sounds. Like, uh, well, like you can sing, uh, let's get a song for it. I have a video I'll show you in just a bit. You wanna watch the video now? Actually, it's fairly interesting. She'll be able to do a glottal stop much better than me. All right, a, um, a glottal stop is when you close the glottis. And this causes that particular sort of poppy sound, as she said. Uh, the frequency of the sound for your, we've seen this already, but the frequency of the sound for your vocal cords is given by this expression, this 1 over 2L square root of T over mu. Remember we saw this before. It's the frequency of a string because the vocal cords are sort of like a string. They're string-like anyway. And the frequency of them will be dependent upon the length of the vocal cords as well as the tension in the vocal cords. They're muscles so you can change the tension and that's the primary way that you change the frequency of your voice by changing the tension of your vocal cords. And then mu, remember, is the mass density. Oh, this is the linear mass density, the mass per unit length. Let me just write that down so I don't forget. This is our mass per unit length. So a greater tension will give a higher frequency. And so the length of the vocal cords also affects the frequency. You can't change the length of your vocal cords, right? They don't change like on a guitar. We can actually make them shorter or longer. You can only change the tension. But people tend to have different lengths of, of vocal cords. So men, for example, tend to have a larger, um, a larger larynx. And so they tend to have longer vocal cords. And you can imagine that if the length of it goes up, that means the frequency will go down, and so they have a lower pitch voice. And that's why, just because their vocal cords are 
are longer. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily the case, but often that's the case because their voice box is bigger, their vocal cords are bigger, they just have a lower voice. And then the amplitude is governed by the amount of air that flows past the cords. And remember, this is uh, due to the diaphragm. Diaphragm. All right. I, let's look at hearing, too, and then we'll be wrapped up. Next time, we'll probably just come together and do the clicker questions. Uh, I'll post those online, so if you don't want to come, that's okay. But if you need clicker points, you should come next time. And you might want to come anyway because we're going to go over questions that will be similar to ones that will be on the test. But, you know, as usual, it's optional. Um, so you have three parts of your ear. The external part. This is the outer ear. Then you have the middle ear. And then you have the inner ear. Or the internal ear. Uh, in the outer ear, you have a couple parts. The outer ear includes this thing, this little funky shaped thing on the, this flap on the side of your head, and it goes down into the ear canal. So it includes the auricle, which is the visible part of the ear. It helps to direct sound waves into the ear canal. sound waves of a particular frequency. And that's why it has that funky shape. Um, direct those sound waves to the ear canal. <laughs> and then the ear canal, it's about an inch long. You can stick your finger down in there. Don't stick your finger in there. That's very bad. In fact, do you know the smallest thing that you should put into your ear canal? No, not even your finger. Your elbow. That's what they say. The smallest thing you should be putting in your ear. Because it's very bad to put things down into your ear. It can squish that earwax in and sort of compact it down next to your eardrum. And it's not good for you to stick stuff down in your ear. You know, use Q-tip. I know that you do. Don't, you're not talking about it. It's okay. <laughs> but like, that's bad to do that because it, it can really damage your ear. You can it's addictive, I understand, but you need to stop doing that because it could be bad for your hearing. Ear canal is about an inch long. It's open at the auricle. I'm closed at the eardrum. So it's like an open closed pipe. Let's see. And it helps to amplify the sound. All right, that's our ear canal. Let's go on into the middle ear. Middle ear has uh, the eardrum and three bones. These are called the auditory what? Do y'all know the three bones? Ossicles, very good. Uh, the middle ear also has the opening to the pharynx. This is called the eustachian tube. You ever have tubes put in your ears when you were a kid? Many of you probably have. That eustachian tube, behind my eardrum, there's a tube that sort of runs down to right about here, I think, into my larynx. And what that tube does is it helps you to equalize your pressure. You ever do this? You on a plane? You squeeze, close your nose, and blow out to equalize the pressure in your ear. In here. Um, what you're doing is you're forcing the, sort of equalizing the pressure between outside your eardrum and inside your eardrum. And that's what the eustachian tube does, is it helps to do that. Now, with kids, the eustachian tube, I understand, is smaller, and there's just more fluid, and it can get blocked up very easily. And that's why kids often get ear infections, because they get a lot of fluid behind their eardrum, that doesn't drain through the eustachian tube. I think it also has something to do with sort of the relative level of the eustachian tube, but I'm not sure about that. Um, anyway, this can get blocked with mucus and infected. The eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane. It 
it uh, vibrates. When sound impinges upon it. And then the auditory ossicles are three small bones. The uh, malleus, incus, and the stapes. Uh, you don't need to know the names of those bones, but you do need to know the ossicles and sort of roughly what they do. These generally uh, act as a lever to transfer the vibrations. From the eardrum to the inner ear. Gosh, bless you all. From the eardrum to the inner ear. Oh, I'm sorry, this is right here. Uh, the transfer vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear. And the, uh, the force of these vibrations is multiplied by about 20. It's a lever, right? So if you have a lever and uh, I have it something like this, if I put in a small force down here, I get a big force here. That's what the, the uh, ossicles do. They just act as a lever uh, to make that force bigger. And then finally, the uh, inner ear. It's three parts. We're almost done here. Is the cochlea. This is a fluid-filled chamber. It looks like a snail. Have you ever seen a picture of the cochlea? It's all sort of curled up like this. It's a fluid-filled chamber. that converts vibrations to electrical signals. You may have heard of these hair cells. You've probably studied the ear. There are hair cells that will actually respond to different frequencies. And so that's how your brain knows uh, these, free, these hair cells will actually vibrate at these particular frequencies and respond to them, and then they'll convert that particular frequency to an electrical signal that goes to your brain. And then the vestibule and the semicircular canals, these are uh, help you to maintain balance. I have a video I want to show you, because, and we'll wrap up with that, because uh, you can try this. Have you ever gotten dizzy before? When you get dizzy, what happens is you spin around and the fluid in those, the uh, vestibule and the semicircular canals, it continues spinning even after you stop. And so when you get dizzy, it feels like you're spinning when you're not really spinning. And so that's the, most, the uh, sensation of dizziness. But I want to show you something. This is pretty cool, so y'all pay attention. I want you to try this later. is the sensation of being up, down, dizzy. 